Hello. Can you hear me at the back? Thank you. All right, everyone. Welcome to the English Enrichment Lecture for 2021. The title of my lecture is Viruses, Black, Pink, Climate Change and Heart Emoji, an Introduction to Cultural Studies. So the field of cultural studies is quite hard to define, but we're going to look at some basic principles today and see how they might be re relevant in your study of English. Have you ever studied advertising in your English class or a newspaper or a song? These days you might encounter different experiences in what we call subject English. You might look at something advertised on the subway, a cartoon from a newspaper, you might even see a technology magazine, a short film, or a book review. So how did this happen? How did these everyday things make their way into our English classroom? There was a time when studying English was very clear. It was divided into using the mechanics of the language, English language class, and understanding the texts that everyone agreed were worthy of study. Shakespeare comes to mind, or the Greek tragedies, the poetry of Keats or Byron or the plays of Chekhov. We can all agree that this is literature. And these areas of study are quite clear. So where do the newspapers and adverts fit in? If you've ever thought, why are we studying this? If you've ever thought, isn't the old way better than the new way? Then hopefully today's discussion of cultural studies will answer some of your questions and might even make you want to study more of this kind of thing. So to learn about cultural studies, we're going to look into these four things. There's images on the board. And we're going to see if we can make some connections. So take a look at the slides. It contains words and images. Think about why I might have chosen these four things. Keep your thoughts in mind because I'm going to ask you again at the end of the lecture and see if you can make some more connections. The first concept is about viruses and I wonder why I chose this as the first thing that popped into my head. Actually, viruses can help us understand some really key ideas in cultural studies. The first is about understanding how language works. The word virus comes from the Latin meaning slimy liquid poison, and it was first used to refer to snake venom. So I think we can all agree that the connotations here are negative. The idea of a virus is also used in our contemporary world through things like a computer virus. But actually the way that languages and information work is quite similar to a virus, and that's why the word viral is used in the internet age. The connotations here are not necessarily negative, so some people want to go viral. Some companies pay people to make their brand go viral. So we can see that language spreads and it changes. It's viral and it's contagious. I always like to look at the word of the year, which is chosen by the big dictionary companies to represent what was happening at that time. I was very proud in 2013 when the word of the year was selfie because the etymology of the word comes from Australia, my home country, because you can see the IE ending is very common in Australian words. We beat out the phrase binge watch, which could be our greatest cultural moment. In the last couple of years, words like lockdown, pandemic, and phrases like face mask and essential worker have been considered as the word of the year. If I was proud of the word selfie, then I can only imagine how Korean speakers feel having 26 new words added to the Oxford English Dictionary recently. We're not up to you yet, Blackpink. Uh, here are a few of the words that have been added, along with K-beauty, K-drama, and the prefix K to indicate things that come from Korea. I was surprised to see that Banchan made it to the list because I wouldn't have thought that was commonly used, but I think it's deeper. Skinship is an interesting example. It's a portmanteau word, which means it's two words combined, of two English words, skin and kinship. It's used by Korean and Japanese speakers which have made it into a new word, and then it has been returned to the English language 
to have a new concept associated with it. That's a positive kind of viral, I think. So what has our discussion of the viral nature of language told us? Well, let's look at our key idea number one. Number one is that language and culture are inseparable. You cannot have one without the other. Culture here refers to the practices, representations, languages and customs of any specific society, which can be any kind of different group of people. We've learned that change, language changes over time, that it's fluid, and most importantly, that it's related to the real world around, it, around us and what is happening. So these ideas have become really important in the English classroom where, to understand what we read, we need to understand the real world that it came from. To understand what we need, read, we also need to think about your real world, what the reader is experiencing when they're reading something. So these ideas all come from cultural studies. The meaning of the word pandemic will be different for your generation than it was for the generation that came before you. And hopefully it will be different again for the generation that comes after you. Let's say one last thing about viruses and languages to get me to my next point. The evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins coined the term meme in his 1976 book, The Selfish Gene. He had no idea of the future internet-related context. He used the word to describe an idea, behavior, or style that rapidly spreads from person to person in a culture. And of course, that's exactly what the internet has facilitated. In his book, he likened the meme spread to that of a virus. But how does an evolutionary biologist make his way into a lecture about the English classroom? Let's think about science for a moment. Science is often portrayed as a knowledge that is objective, truthful, provable, and universal. Languages are the opposite. They're subjective, creative, and idiosyncratic. That's why English is very hard to mark. Well, perhaps the sciences and the subject of English are not as far away from each other as you think. The human body, genetics, evolutionary psychology, the science of emotion, artificial intelligence, climate change, they're all scientific areas that are a part of culture too. In fact, our key idea number two is that there's nothing that's outside of culture. Let's take the example of climate change. I'm sure that many of you are aware that this is an often debated area, even though the science is relatively clear. How did this happen? Well, it's based on some ideas that underestimate how much scientific knowledge is filtered through our political and cultural beliefs. It's part of the liberal tradition that the media should represent both sides of an argument. But in this case, is that really true? Perhaps we'll leave that for another discussion about the importance of media studies. For us, we need to understand that no knowledge, no information comes to us unfiltered. It's always seen through a prism of our cultural and political beliefs. So our second key idea is that not even objective knowledge like science is really that objective. Now it's time for you, Blackpink. Let's see how they can help us understand the subject of English. At its heart, cultural studies is the study of power, and especially the systems of power that are around us and we're often unaware of. So while we could obviously talk about gender expectations here, we could look at the expectations placed on both male and female artists, beauty standards, we could talk about body image. But since gender is probably the most commonly discussed cultural concept in English, I'm going to skip over that and move to another area, which is globalisation. So the members of Blackpink are living examples of the increasing movement of people around the world for reasons of immigration, education, employment, safety, opportunity, all of those things. What this has led to is one of the most important ideas in cultural studies, which is hybridity, or making something hybrid means making a blend of things. So 
Blackpink are a great example of how new combinations of words and new combinations of ways that language is used can take effect and they can spread. They're also an example of cultural hybridity, which creates artists using a mix of traditional Korean influences, American pop, rap and other styles, African-American vernacular, as well as the influences of growing up all around the world in Thailand, Switzerland, Australia, New Zealand and here in Korea. Globalisation is something that you might talk about in other classes, economics or geography perhaps, but global cultural flows are also important in the English classroom. We've seen some examples of how it works today, but it also might show up in your classroom in things like texts that have been translated or texts where the author is from an immigrant background. These things all obviously influence the way that English is used and the way that content is discussed. Through acts like Blackpink and BTS, something that was perceived as local became incredibly hybrid and was really global. And this has been the source of their incredible success. And it's in no small part responsible for the growth in Korean words that we saw in the English, Oxford English Dictionary. In subject English, we concern ourselves with issues of representation. Who are we reading? Who do we hear from? And who is silenced? These are all really important questions to ask. So our third key idea is that understanding power is central to understanding texts. You'll have noticed that I've been using the word text to describe what we study in English. The word text means the written word, right? Well, not quite. A text can be any kind of practice that has meaning. So that can extend to painting, photography, advertising letters, all the different text types that we see in English. They all communicate meaning, and so they're all worthy of analysis, which brings me to my final image. My final image about the enrichment of English is not even English. It's, so why is it here? It can help us not only reinforce the changing nature of language, but it can also lead me to my final point. Emojis are symbols, but so are letters of the alphabet. They're just lines and circles that people have agreed relate to a certain sound. Symbols are amazingly efficient methods of communication, and emojis, another relatively new word, are a part of that communication. The study of symbols, which is called semiotics, shows us how powerful they are in all cultures and subcultures. In this case, you can see I've looked at the word of the year again, and in 2015 was the first time that the Oxford Dictionaries chose a word that wasn't a word. It was the, what we might call the lol emoji, which is officially called the face with tears of joy. My final image is a purple heart. So this is symbolic because it represents a group of people, a subculture. So when we think of cultures, we often think of nations, but there are many, many cultures in the world. And cultural studies also includes the uh, study of subcultures, which is groups within groups. The subculture here is uh, ARMY, the fans of BTS, and it has significance because it's used globally to represent belonging and tolerance and global connection and the power of a grassroots movement. That means regular people. It also shows us how quickly language changes, but perhaps not quite as quickly as we think. We can see here that the very first uh, creator in Unicode was done in 2010. So this emoji is, is getting up there. It's nearly a teenager. This shows us that there's a connection between technology and language. As technologies develop, so does the way that we use language, the way that we share language, and what we talk about. 
So my fourth point is that language is not just words. Subject English is focused on meaning and that can be communicated through many, many different ways, both when you're reading a text and when you're creating a text. We like to see multimodal texts being used, which means a combination of, of methods. You might also notice that most of my examples today have come from popular culture. For me, that's an incredibly important part of culture. It doesn't replace what we might think of as high culture. Our study of Shakespeare still happens. But uh, we should study what is good as well as what is great because they all have something to teach us about the world we live in and the world around us and the world that comes after us. So let's quickly look back on the key ideas that I've introduced today. I assert that language is culture and we should study them together. That there is nothing outside of culture, no matter which subject you're in, even in the English classroom. That power is the central concept that we're looking at when we look at a text. And that language includes things that are not just words. So let's look at the images again. Can you see some of the ideas that we've discussed in these images now? Perhaps you can see that language is fluid, that it's inseparable from culture, that there's a lot of science in the English classroom, that all kinds of power systems are evident in the real world and in the world we live in, in our imaginary worlds, when we inhabit these through our texts that humans love to make meaning of the world around us and we love to share our ideas with each other. I hope you can also see that the English classroom is not just about grammar rules or vocabulary building, although those things are important. It's a dynamic and relevant place where the future is as important as the past, where lots of languages and cultures are included and where big ideas are welcomed. So, is the old way better than the new way? I don't think so. Thank you for your attention today. I will hand you back to your tutors.